when a long train of abuses and usurpations pursuing invariably the same object evinces a design to reduce them under absolute despotism, it is their right, it is their duty, to throw off such government and provide new guards for their future security. Okay, I, I don't actually talk like that. Uh, in fact, no one really talks like that anymore, but they used to, and in an effort to bring a little bit of history into this talk, I have decided to start by quoting the American Declaration of Independence. And though this may sound impressive, where I actually got this line from was a Nicolas Cage movie. <laughs> National treasure. Now, in this movie, Nicolas Cage says this line right before he, spoiler alert, steals the Declaration of Independence. But just before that, his sidekick asks him what it means. And he says, it means that when there's something wrong, that those who have the ability to take action have the responsibility to take action. Now, this is probably an extremely simplified version of what that line actually means. Um, but nevertheless, this idea stuck with me. Those who have the ability to take action have the responsibility to take action. I'll say it one more time. Those who have the ability to take action have the responsibility to take action. But when I heard this, the first thing I thought was, maybe there's one thing that comes before this. And that is, how do you realize that you have the ability to take action? And that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. Today, I want to talk about the idea of philanthropy. I want to redefine the term, try to make it more accessible and practical, and enable you to call yourselves philanthropists. And in doing so, I hope to enable you to take action by realizing that you can. So I took this idea and I put it to use in a setting that was probably not contemplated by either Mr. Cage or Thomas Jefferson, and yes, that's probably the first time their names have been used in the same sentence. <laughs> but I put this to use in Kenya. Uh, in August 2008, I found myself in Kiptere, Kenya, a small rural village that had no running water and no electricity. I wanted to go to Africa after spending a few years in undergrad uh, advocating for Darfur, and I wanted to see what life was like on the ground in, in Africa. So I signed up with a group of volunteers, and I flew to Nairobi. But when I arrived there, I hadn't realized that when I was getting there, it was just a few months after the end of the worst civil violence that Kenya had seen. At the beginning of that year, as a result of some controversial electoral results, the country had erupted in violence, and 1,500 people had been killed, and up to 500,000 people had been internally displaced. And suddenly, there I was. So I, <coughs> excuse me. Um, so uh, as a result of how soon after I was there, the uh, tensions had ended, I was able to meet with a lot of people who had recently been affected by the violence. Uh, they wanted to share their experiences, and as a result, I met with uh, children who had lost parents, women who had been raped, and men who had been beaten, and families who had their houses burned down, and others who had been injured both physically and mentally by what they had been through. And so I spent a month volunteering there, and at the end of my trip, one of the youths I was working with came up to me and asked if there was something I wanted to leave behind. And I thought about it, and I said, why don't I go back to Toronto, I'm going to try to raise some money and send it over to you, and you can try to facilitate a project on your own. And he said, well, why don't we try to do a soccer tournament? And I thought, OK, that's, that's a great idea, it's fun, it's meaningful, and it would provide those youths there with an overall goal. Pun intended. <laughs> so I came back to Toronto, I raised $300, I sent it over to Kenya, and in November 2008, we held our first soccer tournament. Now, I thought about what had been asked of me. It was money, but it was money that would enable some youths on the ground in Kenya to run their own project, and it was successful. And it was so successful that one of the youths involved came to me afterwards and said, can you help us start our own peace-building project? And the challenge would be to have local youth like these involved in learning about their own abilities, their own skills, reaching out to other leaders to empower themselves and run peace-oriented activities across Western Kenya. Now, that's what we did, and in uh, the following year, May 2009, we set up an organization called Youth Ambassadors for Peace, or in Swahili, it's called Vijana Mabalozi Kwa Amani. Now, ever since, the Youth Ambassadors for Peace themselves have been running activities designed to fit with the trends on the ground. 
When civic education is needed, they, uh, they run workshops. When they, they run entertainment programs, they do drama presentations, they reach out to the elderly and the sick, in particular, those afflicted with HIV and AIDS. And they believe that students are the key to Kenya's future. Now, they, uh, they read and they write and they learn and they discuss and they, uh, per and they represent a group of Kenyans who want to be heard and want to participate and want to contribute. Now, I have to say at this point that I was obviously involved in this organization from the beginning and I helped set it up and I still actively fundraise for them, but this is a grassroots peace building project. I became very aware at the beginning that my values could not have a role in determining the framework of this organization, that solutions to be effective needed to come from within and not from outside. And that's what we've tried to do together. Uh, and it's been a success. This project here, I'll tell, you, uh, I'll tell you about a little bit later with these eggs. But it's from this experience that I have learned about the idea of philanthropy, about what it takes to make a difference, and most importantly, how little and not how much is required to initiate that change. So where did this come from? Well, uh, I was lucky to be on the ground in Kenya at a time when people wanted to change the status quo, but I'm also the sort of person who likes to take a look at my surroundings and find inspiration from them. And it's from here that I, I took this idea from the movie National Treasure. Okay, again, those who have the ability to take action have the responsibility to take action. So I took this idea and from a cheesy movie, and I applied it to Sub-Saharan Africa, to a group of youths who really wanted to do something, but who felt that the ability to make that difference had to come from outside. And for that, they turned to me, who just happened to be a representative of the white Western world on their turf. And all I did was take that request for help, use a little bit of Hollywood inspiration, and what I discovered that when they realized that they could do something, that their efforts went into overdrive because they felt like they had to do something. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. Today, I want to teach you how to become philanthropists. And here's how. So this idea of philanthropy is one that's obviously taken on many definitions over the years, but what a philanthropist has quickly come to mean is someone who has a lot of money, who gives a lot of money. But if you think about the word philanthropy or philanthropist, it actually comes from Greek words, uh, words roots. Um, and that, uh, and those, uh, when that you translate that, philanthropy actually means love of humanity. Love of humanity. It doesn't mean love of money, and it doesn't mean epic donor, and it doesn't mean man who founded global institution for peace or, or rich man's club. It is a very simple, flattering title for someone who has a lot of money, who gives a lot of money. And there's no real threshold for how much money you need to, to give in order to be called a philanthropist, but if you look at some of the most notable philanthropists today, you sort of get the idea. These are the, the names that come up when you Google philanthropist. You have Oprah and Mark Zuckerberg and uh, Bill Gates and Warren Buffett and Howard Hughes and Andrew Carnegie. So you get the idea. Now my goal today is not to bash these people. They do phenomenal work, and they do change the world. Nevertheless, why should the title of lover of humanity be held only by people with that sort of money to give? Why can't people with moderate wealth popularly be called philanthropists? What about people with no wealth? What about people who give by actions and not by money? Why are they called just volunteers and not philanthropists? Uh, well, my uh, goal here today is to redefine philanthropists. I believe that not only billionaires or millionaires should be called philanthropists, but that also thousandaires can be called philanthropists, or multi-hundredaires, or even all of those multi nothing heirs who are out there, that they can and should be called uh, philanthropists too. I believe that being a philanthropist just takes a small act, a simple act, and what that act is can be entirely up to your own abilities. Uh, it should be something that demonstrates your love for humanity. It should be extraordinary. And it should be something that, that, that is thoughtful and that is well-intentioned and considerate and just stinks of love. Now, I was once interviewed a couple years ago uh, by, uh, about my project in Kenya. And I was asked the question of whether I thought that it was trivial 
to run small projects on the ground in Kenya when there are so many big projects, um, so many problems facing Africa today. And I thought about it and I was perplexed by both this attitude and this question. How can we be expected to try something new when we are just going to be marginalized for those big projects? I believe that it is these small projects that have the same ability as those other projects to affect uh, change. And that's how you today have the ability to contribute. And what I want you to realize is that even though you don't have $3.1 billion to your name, you each have the ability to make a difference and thereby the responsibility to make a difference. Now, here are quickly two examples of philanthropy as I see it. Uh, this is my brother, Justin. Now, just uh, when I came back from Kenya after one trip talking about a school that I had visited, the Victory Primary School, Justin decided to do something. He was the president of a business club at Laurier University, and together with some friends, he ran a fundraiser to, um, to send money over to that school. So what they did is they uh, raised $700. That money went to build uh, two new classrooms for the school in Kenya. They also had students write personalized Christmas cards here for students there. Now that was so successful, these are the kids, that was so successful that the next year, uh, this group decided to run a similar fundraiser, and what they did is they uh, wanted to buy the students a cow uh, so they could have ready access to milk. So they made a paper mache cow, they stuck a hole in the top of it, and they put that cow in the middle of the student center to raise money, and they quickly did, and today they have that cow. And we're trying to buy them a second. So that is one aspect of philanthropy as I see it. Uh, the second example, and that's the cow, sorry. The second example are the Youth Ambassadors for Peace themselves. Now, these are students who come from rural villages in Kenya. They wear clothing donated by Goodwill, and they don't really have access to higher education. But here they are, spending their time and efforts trying to help others. Now, in 2010, they started a project whereby they buy chickens, collect eggs, and donate those eggs to individuals in their community who have recently been diagnosed with HIV or AIDS. Today, we have over 100 chickens producing many eggs, we also have two cows and four goats, so that when you get your eggs, you also get a donation of milk. Now, these youths, who have maybe $3 each to their names, they are philanthropists. And each year in Toronto here, some high schools, on the 1st of December, which is World AIDS Day, people will set up a table and fundraise for this program. And what you can do is go to this table, spend $5, buy a chicken in Kenya, and you can name it whatever you want. Right, so as a result, we obviously have lots of Justins and Harrys and Selinas and Taylors running around <laughs> central Kenya. And at the risk of throwing around that title too loosely, I'm going to call those students in Toronto philanthropists as well as, as those youths in Kenya. Now, everybody has the uh, opportunity to make a difference in this world. You will hear from some phenomenal speakers today and at other TED events. They seek answers, they try to help, and they have that essential blend of empathy, uh, sorry, motivation, entrepreneurship, and sensitivity. Now, these qualities, though admirable, are hardly unique. They are easily fostered inside of everyone. And my desire today is to enable you to realize that you have these qualities and that you have the ability to make a difference, and with that ability, the responsibility to, to act. Now, what can you do? Well, that's entirely up to you and your interests and your passions, but what I recommend is you use those interests and passions as a guide to figure out what you want to do. If you like writing, then write. If you like reading, read. Uh, you can learn about what's going on in the world and try to figure out what you want to do. Uh, be adventurous, but realize that you don't necessarily have to take a trip overseas to begin this process of becoming an activist or a philanthropist. It can be as easy as learning about what's happening in your own neighborhood or overseas, teaching others about it, helping to, to build a paper mache cow, or visiting someone who's sick, or donating five chickens to buy a, a Justin Bieber chicken in Kenya. Um, with this crucial act of ability and responsibility working together, I want you to realize that you, too, can be a lover of humanity, a philanthropist, and discover your own way to make a lasting contribution. Thank you.